What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of EJ's Press. I'm your evocative, provocative, talkative host, EJ, and today we're going to be rambling on about characters. You might say, well, duh, at some point we've got to talk about characters. They're the core part of writing. And I would argue not only are they a core part of writing, but they are the core part of writing. And the reason is this. And, and I just want to, you know, establish why I think characters should be at the forefront of a story before we dive into what makes a good character. Um, like I, you know, yeah, the characters should be the absolute number one foremost focus of the story for two reasons. One, because they are the lens through which the audience views the story. Uh, the audience is going to experience everything you do through the characters unless you have a very specific set of circumstances, a very specific point of view, um, a third person omniscient that's not tied to any one character. But even then, the audience is still going to kind of assume that's the perception of the character. They won't do it consciously. Um, they won't necessarily consciously assume this. It's excuse me. They won't consciously assume that this is through the eyes of a character, but because the characters are giving the story its action, because the characters are interacting with the world, the audience interacts with the world through them. So they are the lens. The second reason I think characters should be the absolute focal point on the central core mechanic of a story is because the other parts are fairly interchangeable. Um, there's only... I never remember the, the scholar who said this, but the, there's, what, six plots. Um, there's six basic plots in the world. Um, the conflict, there's only a few basic conflicts that you can swap pieces out of. Um, themes, settings, everything like that all stand back and kind of inform the characters. Absolutely. We should, you know, we shouldn't set out, all right, I'm going to make a swashbuckling adventure and for my main character, I'm going to have um, Sergeant Rick Danger, um, World War II war hero. Um, that wouldn't fit in a pirate theme. But you get what I mean, I hope, um, where these things inform how we build our characters, but they don't necessarily make the story important. Um, I, I love world building. I love a well-constructed world. I love a compelling plot. I love good, solid themes. Um, I love stories that have some sort of, um, message of a sort. Um, obviously my opinion varies on how much I enjoy certain messages, but I, I love stories that are trying to tell me something. Um, but at the end of the day, what I come back for is a character. Um, I come back because the characters are interesting, because they're interesting people with interesting lives um, who deserve my attention for some reason. And that's why I think characters should be your absolute number one focus when telling a story, when creating a story, when writing it, when editing it. Everything needs to come back to, is this consistent with my characters? Is this something my character would do? Is what my character is doing important? Um, so with that in mind, let's jump into how to make, um, a compelling character. So I think Ted Decker put it best, um, Ted Decker, author of several novels, um, big influence on, on my, my, uh, reading and writing growing up, um, put it this way, story is a series of events, um, centered around worthy characters who change as a result of those events. So start with, you know, stories, you start kind of with events, you have, well, things have to happen, but the the events are happening to characters. Um, if, if things just happen and you don't have characters, who cares? It's, it's, if a tree falls in a forest, no one's there to hear it, is, is the question there. So it has to be centered around characters, but not just characters. They have to be worthy characters. Now, this is something I've kind of touched on uh, previously, what I think makes a worthy character, certainly in a superhero book, but in general, what makes a worthy character? Um, it's something that, as the name might suggest, is worth the audience's attention. It's not necessarily worthy in the sense of um, noble and, and just and self-sacrificing and humble, um, but 
It is someone who is worth the audience's time. Someone who is compelling. Someone who is dynamic. As as the second, as as the third part of his statement goes on the changes. Um, it has to be someone who is more than one note. Someone who has desires, who has conflict. Um, but it has to be someone who is more than just a cookie cutter. Um, I need a 40 year old man. So here's a 40 year old man. That 40 year old man might only be in, you know, five or six scenes, but we need to know who he is. Um, and, and extra, 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 extra. So for, uh, your protagonists where if your protagonist is, is dull, is not worth my attention, I'm not going to care. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's one of the first things I look for when writing a story is I don't care about this person. Um, it, what's happening to him is not interesting me because he's not interesting me. Um, I'm not going to come back to this story. Now, that's a heavier um, that's a, that's a heavier onus on uh, episodic fiction, on television, on comic books, on magazines um, than it is on a novel where, you know, you've, you've got one chance to sit down with these characters, essentially, and then you'll never see them again. But I'm more likely not to finish a novel if I'm not grabbed by those characters as well. So, a worthy character. What is it? Like I said, it's a dynamic character. It's a character who undergoes growth and change. Um, they can't start as... They, they, they can't start one way and end the story the exact same way. Um, unless the story is about, and this this is the only the only time this is acceptable, unless the story is about standing your ground, sticking to your guns, um, maintaining your your status, ma maintaining your ideals. But even then, there needs to be a change in that character. Maybe his ideals don't change. Maybe his attitudes don't change. But his position might change. His his drive. He might go from, I'm I'm gonna let this you know. What, whatever the world wants to do, I'm going to let it happen as long as they don't mess with me. And then he might go into a mode of, you know what, even if it doesn't concern me, injustice is injustice and I'm going to go out and do something about it. That would be a change without compromising his ideals. Um, they have to um, they have to be characters. Um, they can't just be a, a cardboard cutout or a robot. They have to have multiple characteristics. They have to be two, three-dimensional Um I would say look at, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary characters. Um, a primary character needs to be a, a three-dimensional character. They needs to be, and I, I'd argue a four-dimensional character if we count change as a dimension. Um, he needs to have, he or she, I should say, needs to be more than um, just a set of traits. He needs to have beliefs. He needs to have desires. He needs to want something out of life. He needs to want not to have something out of life. He needs to um, communicate these desires and work towards them. Um, you know, a story a story would be boring if a guy said, I want to learn how to skateboard, and then just sat on the couch for 300 pages. Um, that, that wouldn't be a compelling character. Um, he needs to, the, the character needs to work for their desires. Um, that, needs, that needs to be part of his dynamic. Um, that needs to be part of his three-dimensional nature. Secondary characters, um, you can you can kind of cut back. They don't need all the fleshing out that a primary character does, obviously, because the audience is gonna, isn't going to spend as much time with them. One, uh, they won't have enough time to get to know them. Two, you don't want your secondary characters to completely overshadow your primary characters. I think of Ant Man, um, the the character Luis. I, I'm drawing a total blank on the actor's name, and I apologize, but. The guy who would just start into a story and it, it would be my cousin so-and-so knew this guy, knew this guy, knew that guy. Just down a chain. Really annoying character for me. I absolutely, every time he came on screen, it was ugh, this guy again. But I know everybody loved him. And the thing is, you couldn't tell me. I would be willing to bet money if I asked you, hey, uh, what actually, full, what, what was the central development of Scott Lang in, in Ant-Man? How did he change as a character? You wouldn't be able to tell me, but if I said, hey, uh, who, is your, who is your favorite character in Ant-Man? I would say, from my experience, probably five, six to one odds at least, you would say Luis. Very few people hated him. Um, very few people liked other characters more than him. 
he overshadowed Scott Lang. He overcame him, and that's that's a bad thing for a secondary character. But it was it was admittedly something that I think um, Ant Man was going to run into from the get go because it was trying to take a character who had been written for Civil War before Ant Man came out. They knew what role he was going to play in Civil War. Um, you know, un- understand that with Marvel, they they have plans five, six, seven years in the future. Um, they knew what role he was going to play in Civil War, and that was the comedic side character who has a couple bits, and then he's done. So then they had to introduce him and create this whole movie to give us an idea of who he was, and um, they they stumbled at the first hurdle because they'd made a side character, and now they had to expand on him, and they didn't know how to do that. They didn't know how to make this side character more than that. He's a great funny man. He's a great um, comic relief in this movie that's mostly boring meetings and gray parking lots. But he can't carry a movie on his own. The character is not created to carry a movie on his own, and that's fine. It's kind of a similar reason to why they got rid of Edward Norton in as the Hulk. For one thing, he's notoriously difficult to work with. But for another, and, and this is, I think, the primary reason, they realized that Edward Norton would not share screen space. He would not allow the Hulk to be a secondary character, and that's what they decided they needed him to be, because the Hulk movie was the least successful of Phase 1, so they said, okay, when we do our Avengers movie, the Hulk is going to have to be a secondary character. Um, not Most people aren't really concerned with this skinny little nerd who gets mad and turns green, so we're going to have to pull him back, put, you know, maybe give Thor more of a part, give Coulson more of a part, give Nick Fury, give Scarlet Witch... Um, give them more parts because people didn't react to uh, Hulk as well as we wanted. So they pulled him back, and now he's he's a decent side character. But you know, even even with um, Ragnarok, where he's where Mark Ruffalo and Chris Hemsworth are sharing screen time, um, he's he's a secondary character now. He's he's right up there with the protagonist. But even then, he's kind of a bit character. He's got funny bits, he's got some clever lines, but he really doesn't accomplish much in terms of uh, plot development, character dynamic. Um, so they've, they, Marvel does that to themselves, where they write these great side characters. Fantastic characters that are well-suited to fitting on the sidelines do not do well when put into the spotlight. So that's something to watch out for, creating a side character, is make sure they don't overshadow your primary te- your your primary characters and make sure they don't ever get put in a position where they might have to act beyond their range essentially where where these characters might have to um you know get their day in the limelight make sure their day in the limelight doesn't push them further than they're capable sorry throw was getting kind of dry there anyway <clears throat> Um, with so so secondary characters, um, it's still multi-dimensional, still two potentially three-dimensional characters, um, and it's a good idea to know more about um, your side characters than the audience does, um, just because it will allow you to write them more effectively. But you don't need to put all that focus. And then tertiary characters are the characters who are in for a scene or two, um, who show up in Atlas Cobalt Nights, which is the book I'm working on now. Uh, there's a char- there's a couple characters on the Tomorrow Force, the the big superhero team, who show up for a couple scenes, but really aren't that involved in the story. Um, they show up, they've got a couple lines. There's some funny interactions with them. I enjoy I enjoy playing with them, and I'm I'm sure I'm eventually going to come back and write like a Tomorrow Force book where I get to explore these characters more because I know a lot more about them. There's a lot to some of these characters that just never is going to show up in in an Atlas book or in a Zephyr book because they're not uh, they're not part of the story in that way. So a tertiary character can be developed to an extent, but they they can't overshadow the secondary characters because they're not going to be there for more than a minute. And the tertiary characters I've found are kind of where the ensemble dark horses start popping up, where the characters that no one expected to be popular become popular. Um, the ones that just show up for a couple scenes and everybody's like, we want more of that guy. Boba Fett, for example. He was almost... A non-character. He he was he was almost window dressing for Jabba the Hutt if it weren't for the fact that he was the one who found and caught Han Solo, who who apparently had this grudge against Han Solo, and they kind of delved more into that into the EU before that became um, non-canon by Disney, uh, decanonized I should say by Disney, but 
he was a character, <clears throat> excuse me, he was a character who um, really didn't have any characterization. He was quiet. Um, he stood in the background. He wore a jetpack. That was about all we knew about him. Um, he wanted money for Han Solo. And he disintegrated people. That was another thing. Darth Vader told him not to disintegrate people. So that is the only other thing we know about him um, was that he disintegrated people. So not a huge, not a huge character. <clears throat> but everybody thought he was cool. Everybody wanted to know more about Boba Fett. So with that in mind, um, he's, he's what I mean by an ensemble dark horse, a character who really no one cares about, who really, on, on the writing team, I should say, no one really cares about, nobody really puts a lot of effort into him. They're basically set dressing and then all of a sudden, popular. Um, and, and as a result, Boba Fett got he got his cameo in the uh, in the prequel trilogy um, as Jango Fett's clone. Um, he got there was a book series when I was growing up that was just like little paperback novellas um, about Boba Fett trying to find his way through the galaxy now that his dad was dead. Um, there was a long series of of interest in the character, even though he didn't get a lot of development. So those. Those can happen. Um, those, I, I wouldn't say you messed up, obviously, if, if that happens, because that's audience and um, interest. And that's something that, as a writer, you can't really gauge accurately. You're a little too close to the work to say, I know people are going to love this one. I know people are going to hate this one. Now, I can personally look at the books that I'm writing. I can personally look at the characters I'm writing and say, you know what? I think this guy's kind of a jerk. Um, I know he's, at least in my head, he's kind of a jerk. He's portrayed as a jerk. He does jerk things. People are probably going to dislike him. This one is is sarcastic, uh, dry, very, um, very snippy. People are probably going to like this one. Um, so that sort of can influence your your understanding of how an audience is going to react but understand that you're never going to know exactly which tertiary characters are going to suddenly be everyone's favorite um so those are kind of the three styles and then you want to look at development because that's the second part of of the the sentence uh well third part i should say second part is worthy characters uh sorry uh third part is how they change through the story, how, how the events that occur to them cause them to change. That's the other thing. If you're writing and characters just change, they don't have any reason to change, that gets confusing. Um, that That's inconsistent writing where a character will say the character hates, uh, hates cats and all of a sudden just loves cats for no explained reason. Um, there needs to be something to show, hey, um, you know, a cat saved my life. Suddenly I'm okay with cats. Um, or, or his hatred of cats can be used, um, at the beginning of the story, he hates cats. By the end of the story, as he's learned a lesson on kindness or something, a cat can come up and he can start petting it. And so that can be used, but it is a change that was affected by the events of the story. Um, you can't just say suddenly he likes cats and we don't know why. Um, I would say Harley Quinn is probably the biggest, um, <laughs> victim of this problem where she's just suddenly a good guy. Um, she's just suddenly left the Joker. She's got, she's got, uh, I don't know the name of it now. It's, it's reverse stock, Florence Nightingale syndrome. Um, she has Florence Nightingale syndrome. She falls in love with the Joker as his psychiatrist, um, in Arkham Asylum and becomes this, she's, she's abused by the care, by, by the Joker. Um, she's, it's not a healthy relationship as, as you might guess, uh, a homicidal maniac, but she sticks with him cause she's, she's in love with him, um, as, as twisted and horrible as it is. Um, but probably around 2013, 2014, um, DC decided she was going to walk away. She was just going to be done with the Joker. Um, she was going to go have some adventures with Poison Ivy, um, adopt 80 dogs and move in with a circus act. For some reason, um, they never adequately, at least at least to my interpretation, they never adequately explained why those changes were taking place. It just smacked of, hey, we know people like that edgy, crazy girl. Um, we, we think that might be a good way to get people in. It was basically appealing to the Hot Topic crowd. 
Um, it was it was basically just saying, hey, um, look at all these edgy people who like to pretend to be crazy. Let's give them a character. Let's let's give that character a book. And it sold pretty well. Um, it stuck around for, I think, 30 issues or so, which is not terrible. Um, it, it could be better. It was about two and a half years, but that was right around. Um, there was some shakeups there, and I think it picked back up. I think that book carried on until Rebirth. I don't know for sure, but because I I stopped following it. Um, I I noticed it on the shelves. Um, I had a friend who read it, and I I would ask her now and then, "Hey, how's Harley Quinn doing?" Um, but it was it was kind of appealing to that the the Tumblr nerd um demographic which is a problem because the tumblr nerd demographic doesn't typically buy a whole lot now granted they could have they can buy a uh, one comic and keep it running for a few years which is good for them um but and, and fortunately dc didn't do marvel where they went all in on appealing to the tumblr nerd demographic but they did they did have their their one uh, uh dalliance with it um and that was harley quinn but as I was saying, she didn't really get a justified reason. There was no event that caused her to change. It was just all of a sudden the writers said she realizes this is an abusive relationship and she leaves. Um, which is silly because it's been explained to her, it's been pointed out, and she's on multiple occasions said, I know, I still love him, I'm going to stick with him. So frustrating on that front. But anyway, that that's... That is the danger you can fall into with characters that change, dynamic characters, is their dynamicism, their dynamicism, yes, uh, has to in some way relate to the events of the story. They should change, by all means. Characters should change. People change. Um, they shouldn't, the other thing to watch out for is that they become someone they weren't at the beginning of the story. They should change. They should learn new things. They should gain new attitudes, a new appreciation of this, that, or the other thing. They should not become a totally different person unless there is a really good story reason for it. Darth Vader did not become a totally different person when he turned to the dark side. He just admitted he's he's a very angry, impotent man, and he really wants the power to not be angry and impotent all the time. Or at the very least, not to be impotent, he's okay with the anger. Um... So even even that change from Hero of the Republic to um, Jedi Killer wasn't as dramatic as people who might have been standing outside who hadn't spent three movies with him might have understood. They, you know, people who grew up or, or watched him grow up, rather, would be able to say, we told you, we told you not to train this one, um, but you did it anyway, and now look what you've done. Um, but they would... You know, it with with that, it's an understandable change. It's dramatic. It's it's powerful. It's huge for the character, but he's not really becoming a different person. He's not losing everything that he was to become something new in the sense of suddenly you don't recognize him. Where where if your character by the end of the story would walk into the room and you would have no idea who they were, that's going to send up a red flag in a reader's head to say, okay, so the sequel is going to be about figuring out what went wrong here and why we need to fix it. Because people don't entirely change without divine intervention. Um, and as the writer, that means you deciding you're going to change them. So understand that you have that power. Um, you have the power to change your characters and use that wisely. Um, but yeah, be, be very, you use your power wisely with, with changing characters. Be careful with that. It is a dangerous and slippery slope, too much change and they become unrecognizable and your audience can no longer relate to them um too little change and they become flat and boring and your audience can no longer relate to them um there's there's a very happy middle ground and it's a dangerous line to walk it's tricky and the the real trick about it is that different characters that line is in different places some characters should change very little over the course of time some characters are stead um firm strong uh, influences or, or role models or the villains typically change less than the heroes, for example, um, where, yes, they, there should be some dynamicism there, but 
they probably should stay reasonably recognizable. They, they should stay close to their origins. Whereas some characters, you know, any, any coming of age story, any teen drama is going to have gobs and gobs of, of character development and change by the end of the story. So be aware that that line is in different places for different kinds of characters, for different kinds of stories. But bear in mind that a character has to change to be worthy. Um, to make an interesting story, they have to change. But what do I know? I'm just rambling on. Like what you heard and hungry for more? Like and subscribe to the channel and drop a comment if there's a subject you want to hear me ramble on about it. It'll really help out the channel. Thanks.